Hey guys, Chris here with the good old gamer. So today we're gonna check out the AMD Phenom and Phenom 2 CPUs, the K10 architecture, and see how that holds up today and in comparison to the other CPUs we've tested thus far. So stick around and check it out. As with our other IPC tests, we're gonna take a quick look at what was said about the Phenom CPUs when they were released and how they were received by the community. So back in 2007, Anantech did their review on the original Phenom CPU. Some of the big highlights are, at first the Phenom was going to launch at either 2.8 or 2.6 gigahertz. Then we got word that it was either going to be 2.6 gigahertz or 2.4 gigahertz. A week ago, the story was 2.4 gigahertz or lower, and then a few days ago, we got final launch frequencies of 2.2 and 2.3 gigahertz. Now, with the original Phenom CPUs, this was a major limitation to that particular CPU lineup. The clock speeds and yields just simply were not there. Taking a quick look at some of the final words, it's tough to believe that we are looking at here is the farewell to the K8. When AMD first released the Athlon 64, its performance was absolutely mind-blowing. It kept us from recommending Intel processors for at least three years. So that's basically three years where Intel was not a viable option. A lot of people tend to forget about that here today. Phenom's arrival, however, is far more somber. Phenom has a difficult job to do. It needs to keep AMD afloat for the next year. Phenom is much more like a solemn relative visiting during a time of great sorrow within the family. Let's hope AM for AMD's sake that it can lift spirits in the new year. So that basically sums up what people were feeling when the Phenom first launched. Simply wasn't fast enough to be competitive with the Core 2 Duo. Now on an IPC scale, we're going to see how architecturally behind it really was or how competitive it was. Moving on to the Phenom 2, this was a much more interesting launch because of a few factors we're going to look at here. And one of the big things was Intel had its Core i7 HEDT platform already up in swing with the X58 platform. So by the time AMD actually got the K10 up and running, it was going up against some pretty stiff competition. But Intel did not have a mainstream Core i7 or i5 series out yet so that was actually a good thing and that's basically what an on tech says here in their review the phenom 2 is amd's return to competition and unlike the best the original could do the sequel actually is worthwhile even if intel drops prices to maintain control of the quad core market you have amd to thank for that it's similar to what happened in the gpu market last summer competition keeps prices in check I did a whole video on that. If you guys want to check that out, uh, competition is very much needed in all aspects of every market everywhere. Economic woes or not, both AMD and Intel are fighting hard for your business this year. Essentially, the Phenom 2 does extremely well against the Penryn and Wolfdale CPUs that we checked out in the last IPC video. So we're going to see how that really shakes out architecturally here today. Now let me introduce you to the two CPUs we're gonna be using for our testing here today. And the reason why I have to go over this is because the first CPU for the Phenom, the Agena Core, which was the name of that CPU lineup, we're actually using an Athlon X2 7850 Black Edition. Now the reason why we're using this instead of one of the Phenom-based CPUs is because it has a base frequency of 2.8 gigahertz. All our tests are run at three gigahertz. None of the other CPU lineup have anything near that, and I needed to make sure that we could achieve that clock speed. Now, this is a harvested chip. It is basically the same as the Phenom X4s, just with two cores disabled. The important thing to note is it does have the exact same amount of L3 cache. The entire lineup is identical, so there is no difference there, and we're only looking at single-thread performance anyway. The other thing is it's a black edition CPU, so this way all I have to do is raise the multiplier. We're not overclocking anything special here, so front side bus frequencies and memory frequencies will be in line. And my CPU had no problems hitting 3 gigahertz with stock voltage, so that is the reason why we did that. And you will also see on the charts I will refer to this as a Phenom X2, as I don't know why they kept the Athlon name other than the fact that the Athlon name was still very strong back then. 
but realistically, it is a Phenom X2. Now, for the Phenom 2 series, this was much easier. Uh, we just went ahead and used a Phenom 2 X4 945. These are stock clocked at 3 gigahertz, and, well, it's the same as all the rest of them. It does have the 6 megabytes of L3 cache, which is significantly higher than the original Phenom, and we'll see if that has anything to do with its performance gains or if there are any performance gains between the two, other than the higher clock speeds achievable. Starting off with Cinebench R15, we see that the original Phenom CPU has a hard time even overshadowing the Athlon 64, only beating it by two points, and coming in seven points behind the Conroe-based Core 2 Duo. Now, the Wolfdale CPU takes a much, much bigger lead over the original Phenom. Now, Phenom 2 does come in a little bit closer and does overtake the Conroe core, but is still seven points behind the Wolfdale. Moving over to Blender, we do see a different story here. We have the Phenom, the first generation, actually much faster than the Conroe core, much faster than the Athlon 64s, and almost as fast as the Wolfdale-based Core 2 Duo CPU. And interestingly enough, we see the Phenom 2 X4 actually take the lead in this particular benchmark. Moving over to the CPU-Z benchmark, we're going to talk more about this as we're starting to notice a trend that this seems horribly unreliable, but I'm going to keep using it since I've started using it from the beginning. We will just continue throughout all of our testing, but we can see here there's a very large disparity. The Core 2 Duo CPUs absolutely murder the Phenom CPUs, and even though they are a little bit faster than the Athlon 64s in this particular test, this is just not even close. It's just a blowout. And realistically, this test is a huge outlier compared to the others. Switching over to Ida 64's integer test, their queen benchmark, we see that there's a pretty fair competition here. Uh, but what's really interesting is we notice that the Athlon 64's aren't too far behind the Phenom 2's in this particular test, which means overall the integer-based performance really hasn't improved all that much going from K8 to K10. And both Core 2 duos are solidly ahead, anywhere between 500 and 800 points. Another interesting thing to note in this particular test, the Phenom 1 actually outperformed the Phenom 2. That's just kind of interesting. Realistically, I would expect them to basically be about the same as we also saw the same performance on the Athlon 64s. So this is probably just margin of error here. Looking at the Ida64 FP32 test in their FP32 ray tracing benchmark, we see a major uplift in FP32 performance from the Athlon 64s. Ironically enough, this was the only benchmark that the Pentium Ds could compete with the Athlon 64 CPUs, and then of course the Core 2 series just absolutely murdered everything before it. Now the Phenoms basically tie with the Intel CPUs on this particular benchmark. So we have 269 versus 267. I mean, we can chalk that up to margin of error and kind of the same thing here at 294 versus 291. Basically, you can chalk that up to margin of error as well. So very good showing from AMD uplifting their FP32 in basically an equal amount that Intel did from NetBurst to the Core 2. Now, taking a quick look at the Ida64 memory latency test. Now, we do have L3 cache on the Phenoms, so we get to add that in. Yay, more, more graphs, more data. Um, so this is all measured in nanoseconds. Lower is obviously better here. So we don't see anything too drastic going on. Um, still one millisecond on the L1 cache. Only NetBurst was using 1.4. All the rest are using one millisecond. Now, on the L2 cache, we do see a pretty good performance increase on the Phenom CPUs down to 5.4 milliseconds. And that's in compared to the odd but very high 22.1 on the Athlon 64 6000 plus. But the more realistic number of 7.8 on the 5000 plus, that's still a pretty good decrease in L2 cache right there. So that's a good latency increase. Now L3 cache, we can only compare the two here. And this is probably one of the reasons why the Phenom 2 actually performs a good bit better than the Phenom 1, besides the fact that it has more L3 cache is the fact that it is also lower latency. So that helps out as well. And then on memory latency, 
that is also significantly better on the Phenom 2. So we go from 72.9 nanoseconds down to 63.7. Now, as far as memory latency goes, like we've talked about in the previous IPC tests, because the Core 2 still relied on the motherboard's memory controller, that's the reason why these are a bit higher. But interestingly enough, we do see that the memory latency is higher than that compared to the Athlon 64 CPUs. Realistically, though, obviously these CPUs are faster and are performing much better in these tests. So it shows that memory latency isn't necessarily that huge of a factor. It ultimately just kind of comes down to the architecture and how it can utilize the resources the best that it can. Now, I want to go into the reason why I've taken CPU-Z out of the overall benchmarks, and that's because... Of this. Okay, so if we take a look, this is using the Pentium D830 as the baseline, so that's 100%. We're seeing that the Wolfdale CPU is essentially 100% faster than the Phenom 2 in this relative performance test. Now, this is the only test that we see this. If we take out the CPU Z benchmark, this is what the overall numbers of all the other tests using the Pentium D830 as the baseline look like. And this is a much more realistic comparison here. Now, this lines up more with what Anantec said in their review that the Phenom 2 is far more competitive with the Wolfdale and Penryn CPUs. Now, those CPUs still come out faster, but not a lot faster. And we can see that if the Phenom could have actually clocked higher and hit the targets that they were trying to, that's pretty much in line with the original Conroe-based Core 2 Duo CPUs. And that would have been a much, much better competition than what we saw back in the day, because IPC-wise, they're relatively similar. The Wolfdale is a little bit higher on this particular scale here. Now, one of the things that I've changed for this test, because we have more CPUs, we're now going to look at the overall percentages from different baselines. So on this one, we're going to use the Athlon 6000 Plus as 100%. And we can see, for example, that Netburst CPUs are about 45% slower than the Athlon 64. And then we have Conroe coming in at 25% faster. And we have Wolfdale coming in at 36.6% faster. Now we have the Phenom coming in at 22%. 0.65% faster than the Athlon 64. Now let's go back to the previous chart using the Pentium Ds. That means Intel basically gained 126.5% going from Netburst to Conroe, and AMD only gains 2265 Now that's not anything super crazy. We know that Netburst's IPC is not very good, that's the reason why they were targeting higher clock speeds, but it does show exactly how strong the Athlon 64s really were relative to the Netburst architecture. And finally, setting the Core 2 Duo E8400 as the baseline, as 100%, we can see exactly how the Phenoms stack up. As of right now, this is the overall fastest architecture that we've tested, and at this point, the original Phenoms come in at 89 0.75% of that, so basically 10% slower, and the Phenom 2s are coming in at about 5% slower. So while not on par architecturally, they are very, very close and very, very competitive. And really, it just kind of comes down to the Phenom 2s coming out so late, the core architecture already being out, and the Phenom 1s simply not getting the yields and clock speeds that they needed to be competitive. The architectures themselves are clearly good enough to have competed, but there were just problems that kept getting in the way. And ultimately, that's what it really comes down to. Sometimes things don't work out. The architectures themselves are not bad. So when you think back and you're like, oh man, the Phenom was crap. Well, there was other things and other factors in there. You know, there were bugs inside the original Phenom CPUs that caused problems and slowdowns. And like I said, yields and manufacturing were a bit of an issue. And that's one of the things that Intel have relied on so long is their fantastic manufacturing and having the ability to get yields and nodes ahead of their competition. That's basically the reason why they were so dominant for so long is because they were one step ahead on technology throughout most of that time. And AMD was trying to play catch up with the Phenom. And what happens when you try to rush out a product? You have all kinds of problems. You don't hit your clock speeds. You don't hit your yields. And you have a shit ton of problems. Now, they took their time with the Phenom 2, which turned out very good. But it came out probably about a year too late to really be considered really competitive because everybody saw the Core i7 CPUs at that point and were like, 
Ooh, I want that. Now, granted, they weren't mainstream at the time the Phenom 2s launched, but everybody knew that that would eventually scale down and become a more mainstream product. And that's what we're going to be taking a look at in the next video. We're going to take a look at the first generation Intel Core i7 series or Core series. It's really hard because you have Core 2 and then you have Core, so it's kind of backwards. But we're going to be taking a look at that in the next IPC video and see exactly how much faster that technology really is because even today, Intel is still basing their CPUs on that technology. Now, it's not the same architecture. That pretty much starts with Sandy Bridge, but it is the same underlying technology that they're still using in their new Coffee Lake and even their upcoming Whiskey Lake CPUs that aren't even out yet. So let's see how that compares to everything else that we've tested so far. And then, of course, after that, we will be taking a look at the infamous AMD FX series and see realistically how that compares to all of the rest of these CPUs. Is it really as bad as we all think? I don't know. I haven't tested it yet. So I can't wait for that as well. So let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. Are you excited for those videos? I'm really excited to go ahead and test those. And if you like this video, please go ahead and hit that like button. Please subscribe. Please share with friends. I think that this is pretty fun information. This isn't the kind of testing most places do uh, just because, well, equalizing out CPUs from all these old generations don't really matter today. It's more academic than anything else. But it's really cool to see exactly where everything shakes out architecturally. And if you really want to help support the channel and you want to help me get this stuff on hands, we're starting to get into really expensive CPUs and platforms, more mainstream stuff that are still usable today. So why they, they're still holding their value. People still use all this stuff. Um, please consider helping me out on Patreon. There's going to be links in the description below. I'm going to put cards and stuff up here. Uh, as little as $1 a month. You know, $1 a month helps get me this stuff on hand so I can do these videos. And honestly, the more of you guys that can help me out, the more stuff I can get in the shorter amount of time and then the more testing we can do. Uh, so I don't know when the next video is going to be in the IPC test. We've been doing kind of every weekend for the past month or so. Uh, the next stuff isn't super expensive, but pretty much everything past that is going to be pretty, pretty pricey. So I don't think we're going to be able to do these as frequently unless we get like a huge influx from the community, which that'd be great if you guys can help out. But, you know, we can wait. That's fine. I have a bunch of other stuff that we're going to do as well. Once again, let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. And that's all I have for today. And then I will catch you guys in the next video.